Hi, welcome to the Sweet Slumber Podcast, the good, the bad, and the sleep deprived. I am your host, Meredith Bruff. I'm a wife, a mother of five, a childcare expert, and a sleep coach. I'm here to teach you the most effective sleep advice for infants and young children. With my guidance, sleep will become something that you look forward to again, and you will feel rested. I believe that motherhood is the most important and demanding role that we have, but the challenges and accomplishments that go along with it go unnoticed frequently. We are going to talk openly about these things so that we can draw strength and compassion from each other. I will share my perspective as a seasoned mother and help you experience more fulfillment. Welcome to tonight's workshop. It is called Changing Your Mindset to Sleep Building versus Sleep Training. Okay, so we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about all sorts of good things tonight. And I'm excited about this topic because I've never really thought anything like this in bits and pieces, but never focusing on this topic completely. So my topic has come from the posting and the discussions that we're having in social media and the Facebook group. So it's great because I have resources that you can look at and um, refer to. You've been already thinking about these things and we're just elaborating on them and you're getting a major perk because in social media, I'm just putting this one thing out there in the Facebook group. I'll do a short video. But with you guys, I'm going to do a very in-depth conversation about this topic of pros and cons of sleep training and um, crying methods and non-crying and what matters and what works. And also like what you need to do mentally to adopt or embrace this approach. And hopefully by the time we're done here, you'll feel really good about um, being a part of my membership site and following my approaches and my advice and maybe even feel at peace in your heart and your mother heart about everything about where you're at what you've done and what you're doing and the timeline that you're waiting for and on <laughs> right now as you develop sleep habits so this title changing your mindset to sleep building I've been kind of reading what other experts say about sleep training just to prepare myself for these posts that I've been making. And one of them said that you could call it sleep training or sleep learning or sleep teaching. And I'd never heard that before that these other terms. And I thought, well, that's cool. I don't have to use sleep training to help other people um, explain themselves. You know, in my successful sleep group, I tell people not to say sleep training because it always means cry it up or fervor to many people. Anyways, the more I thought about it, I was like, it doesn't work. Nobody's going to even be familiar with the sleep teaching and sleep learning phrase. And then I realized that I talk about building sleep habits all the time. That's like my favorite phrase. And I'll talk about that in a second. Why? Um, so I'm going to just kind of start using that. I've used peaceful sleep training, and now I'm thinking we're going to go more towards sleep building. So um it's just the way that we do things in baby steps and that we lay a foundation and we get it right and we take our time and we're building skills instead of just throwing a kid in the crib and shutting the door. So it's quite a different process. I know a lot of other experts are definitely teaching about sleep cues and room environment and routines and schedules and stuff like that. So I know that there's more to it, but when it comes to teaching little ones to self settle and sleep through the night, there's just not that much support. So um, I'm going to refer to some things that I've taught. I'm going to share my screen. So yesterday's post, um, I explained what sleep training is in the world. You might think sleep training means improving a baby's sleep, but it's a little more in depth than that. It means teaching your baby to fall asleep without help from you, fully awake, drifting off without being rocked, swayed, cuddled, nursed, or shushed. They learn to fall back to sleep and connect sleep cycles without help too. Sleep training is often associated with crying, especially cry it out and fervor, where you are not supposed to console your child. I think with um, fervor, you're able to um, pat or calm them just a little bit when you go in for time checks, um, but you're not allowed to pick them up. So then I just said, but does it have to be like this, you know, where it's associated with crying? Do you have to choose between sleep training and not sleep training? Because that's what I read, that people are deciding between these two things. 
Um, and I just said, there's a lot of sleep training that doesn't work for many parents and children. You have parental intuition and instincts and they're powerful tools. They help you know and meet your child's needs, communicate with them and comfort them. They help you make decisions, the intuition and instincts help you make decisions for your child's well-being and sense when something's wrong and no one else can do this for you or for your child. No one else has the superpower. And so then I just kind of go into that sort of thing. And I want to go back to that in a minute, but um, I just want to help you think about some things. Um, sleep experts teach parents to sleep train using methods that are strong in one way or another. They want you to do what you need to do to get your child to fall asleep on their own and connect sleep cycles. That's the big focus. And some don't mind any amount of crying for any length of time, um, where others are more compassionate and teach you to check in as long as it doesn't make your child cry harder, <laughs> then don't do it. Right. Um, for the gentle crying methods, it's okay to be there and comfort your child, but you're still meant to be a thousand percent consistent, push through using the methods day and night over and over until your child sleeps well. And it is sometimes slow paced, sometimes it's rushed. And often there's some methods where you're supposed to just sit in a chair and console using your words. You're not supposed to get up. So, so what I see is methods that are very rigid and strict again, rules, which is the hardest thing for you guys to navigate. There's so many rules and it gets so confusing, but their methods are very strict and they're not meant to be flexible. And so for me, that's already a red flag because kids are so different. The people who believe in this method, and I mean like teach it and expect it to work, like the experts, A, work with easy babies and toddlers. <laughs> B, and some of these are ors, feel so committed to what they've seen and their results that they don't really consider much else. See, they don't, they know these methods don't work for all babies or parents, but they're still so determined to use their methodology because it works for so many of their clients. They don't really, this is D, don't really consider trying anything else or coming up with something new. They don't understand the need for something different. And I haven't settled like that. I couldn't stand the thought that my methods and approach wouldn't work for kids, any kids. That broke my heart. I needed answers for everyone. I worked hard, I prayed hard, I tried everything, I researched everywhere and prayed and pondered some more over the course of the last three years. And I'm sure that in six months, I'm going to know some new things. I'm always learning and I love that. I'll find some ideas that work even better. My journey has helped me see that many kids and parents need something different than what's available in the books, what's available in the blogs, what's available from the sleep experts. And many parents are struggling and hopeless and they've chosen to wait for years and co-sleep because they had no more energy to give into trying new ideas or repeating the same ideas. And there's very peaceful sleep coaches out there who believe in waiting and letting go so you aren't stressed. So this mentality is like attachment parenting and co-sleeping and just let go. Just stop worrying and go with the flow. I just found a new lady yesterday who teaches that. And I think it's really good because they're letting a lot of moms off the hook and letting go of stress taking away all this pressure, which is one of the things that I want to do for you too, um, especially the sleep rules that are out there. And the problem is these experts haven't found solutions. They're doing good work and they're supporting moms and opening up their eyes to new things, but they haven't solved the sleep struggles. So today um, in my post, I wrote about the experience I had when I changed my approach from gentle methods to non-crying methods. And so I want to just go over that with you. I'm going to share again. So we're not looking at the left side yet. We have the right side here. We kind of talk about how I understand why cry it out or fervor are chosen. Number one, the doctors and experts are saying they work. You go into a sleep group and the moms are like, yes, do it. It'll, it'll work. It'll be great for you. Um, and like, nobody's really talking about non-crying methods. It's just very rare. Um, you know, the big sleep groups with 50,000, 25,000, hundred thousand people are all in the same mentality. And so how, how could you think you need something different, right? Um, so I told the story of how my non-crying methods came about. And so that's the part I wanted to share a little bit. I wrote, when I started sleep coaching full-time, my one-of-a-kind methods were compassionate and supportive. But my clients and I weren't concerned about having a completely non-crying experience at the time. For most of my clients, it was okay if their little ones cried for a short time, like a minute or two but we always calm them quickly the way that worked best. And just like my methods that I have now, it would work up to that. It would be like, 
you know, we're just letting them fuss a little bit or protest for 30 seconds and then the next time a minute and it's building like that. And over the process, we would usually be able to tell that the child was fake crying or protesting, but it, it was different because now I just say when your child calls you, you could wait a little bit. And um, always my clients would comfort the kids the way that worked best. And we would do it as often as we needed. So I was always very supportive of children and their emotions, but I just had some things happen that changed my, my ways. Um, so then I start to talk about some of the things that, that I believe in, I learned, and I think these are great because this is some of the stuff that I wanna talk about today, what's different about me. So I knew that it wouldn't be good to make abrupt changes. That was an intuitive feeling. And I think that's because making small baby steps works well for us. And for me, it was just like, of course, of course you don't change things fast overnight. And then this next one, I knew that it would be okay to go back to what children were used to while we built the new habits. That was another intuitive thing where I just knew that if we introduce something for a short time and then we go back to the old habit, that it would be comforting and keep these kids calm and cooperative. And I just saw that work more and more and it became my new thing. And I said here, for the first 15 years, I worked with little ones in my daycare during the day and sent them home at night with no instruction. <laughs> I really did. I just did what I did during the day and I sent them home. I don't even think I talked to the parents much at all about it. It was just part of my work. Um, and then by day four, they were sleeping for about eight hours or more and I didn't tell the parents what to do. So this explains that it works to build sleep habits during the day, during naps and bedtime, uh, which is more than I was doing. I was only doing naps. Children can learn to sleep well at night without changing the night pattern. And I should say without the parents changing their night pattern, that's a typo. In my full-time work, I learned many other insights. For example, a mom could skip the method at nap or bedtime and continue on the next time without missing a beat. So that's something that I teach people is when you're using a method, if things don't go great or perfect every time, that's okay. As long as you're trying to move forward from day to day, even in tiny baby steps, then you're moving forward. And if your child is not cooperative and it's not going well, you're not moving forward. My first guess would be that it's a bad time and your child isn't feeling well. And my second guess would be maybe it's the wrong method, but I like to give it some time, at least four or five days. And then I also like to try and make accommodations for the child to make sure that we're not triggering something that upsets them, like shutting the door. Like um, when you put their sleep sack on, are they crying because they know it's time to go to bed? So you can do things to accommodate them. And I focus on independent sleep, but it's okay to do things in baby steps there too, where you just focus on getting your child to fall asleep in the crib. That's a really big deal. Don't worry about the independent part yet. You can do that later. Um, so the next one is, since I've been working primarily with challenging babies and toddlers for the last three years, I've found that keeping them calm and cooperative is the best way to progress. They can get very emotional, intense, and resistant if they cry at all while we work with them. So you find that certain things make them cry. And if it's the wrong timing, it makes them cry. And if you're doing something too pushy, moving too fast, changing things too suddenly, taking away something and just being stubborn that you're not, you know, like taking away the pacifier or taking away breastfeeding to sleep or bottle feeding to sleep or rocking. If you just take those things away cold turkey for kids that aren't super easy going, they're not going to like it. And it's not going to really work. Um, it could just be very upsetting. Um, so it's just kind of my theory, like why bother with the crying methods if you can do it peacefully? Um, some stubborn and difficult babies and toddlers don't like change. You have to be sneaky. And that's really a big part of my work is, or my methods is be sneaky. Keep pushing them a little at a time so they don't really notice. It's the coolest thing. Um, and then it says, I learned that my non-crying methods work great for all temperaments. So that's one of the things that I really want people to understand is they don't have to have a really difficult child. It'll just go faster and easier. So then I talk about this list. So I'm going to stop again, go back to what I was teaching you. We'll talk about that list later. Um, so working with children who aren't easy to care for when it comes to sleep, it's taught me everything I'm passionate about now, everything that's been so important and life-changing for other people. This post just touched the tip of the iceberg on the differences in my approach. To learn more about the differences, I suggest you listen to my podcast episode number three. Um, it's called The 10 Keys to Successful Sleep, and it's a guide for what to change about your approach. It's a guide to what's different about me and how I do things. And it's not very like point blank with examples. So maybe people are like, dang it, 
I wanted more to this, but that's okay because I, I feel it's important to spend some time on that topic and really kind of like this, this um, workshop where I'm really explaining the differences in lots of things. That's just a really great place to focus on the method and, and explain a lot of different, a lot of the things I'm talking about today, but even more so. It's a guide for what to change about your approach. So you can find that podcast episode number three on sweetslumbertime.com forward slash podcast. Let's talk about some of the biggest principles that you're going to need to rethink to build sleep habits. When I say that again, I'm trying to help you picture a process like building a foundation and adding to it brick by brick and making that foundation and that structure strong Strong enough to be storm proof, earthquake proof, hurricane proof, um, which is what happens when our kids go through all these different periods where they don't feel well. Do you want to support your child? Do you want your child to cooperate? Do you want your child to grow and learn or just adapt and adjust temporarily? Some tough, tough kids make progress using uh, crying methods. Um, I see it like sometimes I'll go in and I'll be talking about what I teach and who it works really well for. And then someone inevitably will come in and say, I have a high needs child and we use cry it out and it was just fine. I get that. It does work sometimes. And that is because these kids learn to not ask for help. So you might've heard that theory before from other people. I don't think that's true for all babies. I think that some kids are just easygoing. And they're not really upset by being alone. They don't really care that much. It doesn't bother them to go lay in the crib and have mom walk away. I see that all the time. And if it doesn't bother a child, they might just fall asleep on their own or they might just cry for a few minutes and then things go really well. Some kids maybe for 10 or 15, still not so bad. Um, I wouldn't do that, but I understand it's not that bad, especially if it gets better the next time. I understand, but um, the kids that are more difficult, more demanding, who are often crying and really, really struggling with sleep are going through those leaps and teething and all those different scenarios. And the kids are needy. The parents are exhausted. They think that they've done something wrong. They've spoiled their child or whatever it is. The kid's too demanding now and they need to break their spirit. <laughs> kind of the way they talk about it. Um, but what happens is when the parents aren't responding, they're not giving in and they're not doing what the child's asking for. They just give up themselves. They're like, not working. So I guess I'm going to sleep again. That's fairly easy going because some kids won't even do that. Right. But I think it has to do with how bad they feel and how challenging of a personality they have. Um, but they give up and give in, they sleep better until they don't feel well again. Then the parents help the child for a little while because they, they know the teeth are cutting. They know the child's in pain and then they get burned out and then they think they screwed up and they sleep train again. Sometimes it works again, but sometimes it doesn't. I help a lot of people who go through that. So here's my post from yesterday. Down here, you have parental intuition and instincts. They're powerful tools. And we talked about how there's superpower to be able to tune in and help your child. Um, so when it comes to sleep training and there's all these rules in your mind that you're supposed to follow, it's expected. You feel like if I follow these rules, it's gonna work. I have to follow these rules or it won't work, right? So you get lots of rules in your head because you're reading all these different things and they just keep piling up. So maybe you go to one book and one method and it's not so bad, but a lot of people will do that and then they'll read other things and they're learning more and more things. And then some people will have to try more than one method. And so it gets really confusing. There's so many rules and you're trying to understand the reasons, right? And then sometimes the reasons conflict and the methods conflict the experts are conflicting with each other. Well, the biggest conflict that I find is that you're having to shut off your intuition. You're having to just rely on the rules, memorize the rules, try to understand them, try to make sense of them. Or I'm just going to follow this one because otherwise it's too confusing, right? But your mind is still full of rules. So um, you're not supposed to listen to your intuition. If you ever go into a sleep training group, they tell you, don't worry about it. Nope. Don't go in the room. Nope. Stick to your guns. Um, leave the house, put in the earplugs, let your husband handle it. All these things that go against motherhood, intuition, and instincts. That's why I named this post sleep training versus motherhood, because women feel like they have to choose one or the other. They don't feel like they get to 
follow their intuition and build sleep habits. So there's a big problem with that. Okay. If you you're ever asked to do a method that doesn't go with your intuition, it's not a good fit and it's not a good fit for you. It's not a good fit for your child. It's not the only way. It's probably not the best way for your child to have their needs met and feel secure and have optimal development. All these things over the long term really make a big difference in how a child is healthy and attached to people and functioning and having stress tolerance, all these things. It's so cool. So it's better just to focus on doing it the kindest, the best way you can. First of all, you don't even know, I'll talk about this in a minute, but like the things could go wrong with sleep training. And so um, taking your time and doing it right means not losing a month or two on something that wasn't good for your child. You know, so that's a good thing to think about too. You just don't even know how long it could take. So up here on this post, I said, um, you're supposed to ignore your intuition and only follow the rules. Rules that don't allow you to take note of the sound of your child's cry, the way your child acts, or what you're both feeling. These rules disregard that children are often unprepared to be left alone and can't fall asleep without help. The rules don't take into account the way your child behaves after using the method. I hear that from moms that they wake up constantly, they need to be held, they nurse all night, they hate their rooms, they don't want to go back in there anymore. Um, experts don't tell you that many children will not progress at all, or the methods may even make things worse. These methods don't leave room for you to come up with your own ideas. Okay, so that's what I have a problem with. A lot of times in my sleep group, especially moms will learn what I teach and then go ahead and just do something on their own. And sometimes my clients will do that. I learn a lot from moms because they share what they've learned. They share what their instincts tell them. So even I'm like, oh no, you don't have to just follow what I teach you. Okay. So a lot of times when moms are using sleep training, and I hear this all the time, they question themselves the entire time. They feel like they're screwing up, whether it's following the rules, like I'm doing it wrong. Oh no, it's my fault. It's not working. Or they feel like they're screwing up by implementing the method. Like my poor kid, what am I doing to my kid? You know, um, am I messing up my kid? They feel guilty while they do it. Most of them say it was worth it if the child sleeps better afterward. But then there's some children who never progress and there's some children who sleep worse. And then there's some children who won't go back in their room or their cribs for years. So let's talk about the rest of today's post that I made that has the, um, the list of there are 16 reasons to not sleep train using crying methods. So some of these reasons are for you and some are for your child. So a child could be too sensitive or energetic. So a crying method for a sensitive baby could just really put them over the top because they are really, really upset. They're crying a lot. They throw up, that sort of thing. Um, and like, I just think mostly about the stress of, of changing so much suddenly and pushing hard and not letting them go back to that comforting way of going to sleep. Um, and, and some babies, they're not going to just sleep bad that night. They could be really clingy the whole next day. And you could tell this is not a good thing for them. Um, if they're energetic, it doesn't work because these are the kids who don't know how to just lay there and fall asleep. They need a lot of help to fall asleep. That's why moms are sitting on a yoga ball and bouncing and bouncing their kids in their arms and feeding and swaying and rocking and all these things. It's because it's really hard for that child to fall asleep in the first place. And so if you put a really energetic little one in a crib and you shut the door, most of them are sensitive. So you've got both things. They're freaking out. They're upset. They don't like the change. They're very attached and they want to be with you. And then they're also like, now what? I'm going to play for a little bit, but then I'm just going to lay here and cry because I don't know what to do. I can't do this. And I've seen that all the way up to being two years old, not knowing how to fall asleep without being fed or something. Um, so the next one needing to be picked up to be calm. You know, a lot of these methods say, don't pick up your child. That's it. That's all they say. Don't pick up your child. Well, that does not work for babies who cannot calm down without being held. And that is a sensitive thing as well. Uh, they need physical contact. They need mom specifically. So it's not a good idea. So early on in my um, full-time work, when I created my method, I mean, I, I had a method that I was using in my daycare, but it just wasn't like written out. It was more intuitive. But when I wrote out my method, um, I planned on calming them. And so when we started implementing it, when I would go into people's homes, that was always a rule. And I was really just telling people what to do as we went. That's how I created my method. 
but um, it was just a matter of, okay, he's not coming down. Pick him up. Okay, he's calm. Lay him back down now. Okay, he didn't stay calm. We're done. Method's over. So that's just kind of how it works because you're just trying to push them along a little bit at a time and they get used to that. And then you get to push them a little longer and it goes a little better because they're learning. This isn't scary. You're not pushing hard. I'm going to cooperate. I'm okay. It's so beautiful. And then the other thing is um, they're not super stressed out. So they're not going to push back. It's really cool. But if they're really, really upset and it's just not working, there's two things. One is that I have a method that's for babies who hate their cribs that really inches them along. And the other one is it's just going to be the wrong time. If a child insists on being held while they sleep, most likely they're going through a difficult time and they can't comfort themselves and they feel worse when they're tired and they just want to go to sleep. And that's the only way they know how is in your arms. So moms are having to hold their babies while they sleep, while they nap. And it's extremely exhausting and challenging but there's no cure except to try and find remedies that help them feel more calm when they don't feel well um so another one feeling scared when they're alone that's why we work on security so much um being in pain discomfort overwhelmed i was talking about that needing your comfort and crying for it i just talked about that <laughs> except i didn't say crying for it the reason I bring that up is because if your child is in their bed and they're crying and there's a rule that you're not allowed to pick them up if they're um, like that and you're not allowed to pick them up and you're not allowed to even go in the room, that's terrible because they don't know how to comfort themselves and they don't feel well. And most of the time when parents are using these methods when their kids are sleeping so terribly, it's because they're going through something and their sleep is off because of the internal changes. I skipped be too intense and easily upset. And that that is just about you know their personality, the babies that scream when you put them in their crib um get really really upset really fast and then the other one i i glossed over on accident be in pain discomfort overwhelmed that's you know the timing of we're going to sleep train right now because his sleep is so bad but there's a reason the sleep is so bad so it breaks my heart because they they don't recognize there's a need for remedies and that these kids are needing that comfort and they need it through touch and they need it through your company um, and then crying for hours and sleeping poorly, I already kind of talked about. So some babies will just cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. They won't fall asleep. Like I've heard of kids who cry and cry and then they fall asleep, but there's also kids who just won't until mom gives in and it's been hours. And then the rest of the night's terrible and the next day is terrible, the next day is terrible because the child was so traumatized. And then the last one, they learned to hate their room in bed, like I already talked about. And then on the right side, you may have lasting guilt and regret. I have had moms tell me they have adult kids and they say, I still feel guilty. I still feel terrible. Or they might have a five or 10, 15 year old and they tell me that. Um, feel conflicted. So while you're doing the method, like I said, you might be like, oh, I'm messing up or this doesn't feel right. I can't believe I'm supposed to do this. Is this really supposed to work? Is it working? Should I keep going? And then you ask someone in the group and they're like, keep going. And then there's me saying, no, don't do it. This isn't a good fit. <laughs> so lots of conflict. Turn off your intuition. So if you have to turn off your intuition, it's not a good idea. This is an outdated practice that is not taking into account that mom instincts and intuition work and they're awesome and that we should care about how our children feel and we should be there and support them and not stress them out. Um, some moms lose confidence because they're trying it and it's not working and they think they did something wrong or they feel like a failure because their kid's not sleeping well. And that is so not mom's fault. Um, feeling confused and worrying often. So that kind of goes back to the conflict, um, worrying often like um, all the sleep is, is going wrong, it's my fault. And I just can't get this right. I'm trying everything and nothing's working and just feeling like everything's stressful and you're anxious about everything. So that can happen from trying to use cry it out and having it not go well. Um, questioning yourself as well. I've talked about that. Ignoring your child's needs. That's a problem because these kids are crying for something and that's the only way they can communicate. And we don't want to teach them that we're not going to respond. We want to teach them to trust us and um, being responsive and building security. That's what's going to produce a healthy child for the rest of their life in so many areas. And then the last one, you may not solve the problems. 
you know, it may not work. And so it could be a really stressful experience and then not work. So it's just better to follow your instincts, your intuition. And I'm so grateful that God has given me these gifts and knowledge. I mean, I learn all the time and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to teach you guys. I'm glad you're, you're here. You're working with me. Um, and I know that it's hard and you wish that things could be easy. So do I, I wish things were easier on you. Um, I wish this was just a one week process. It's not fair that that's something fast and easy for other people and not for you. And I, I hate that. But since you have a child that's not like other children, you can't change them with a magic wand. I want to help you understand some things. And I think that this works better when you're watching one of my videos that's kind of feel good and motivational. I think that you just kind of learn things when I'm teaching you and I tell stories and I talk about things that I felt in my heart. Um, in my online program, I have a video each week where I talk like that with the moms and they just kind of like grasp different concepts through these stories and stuff. Um, I have a little press for time. So I made a list of things that parents tell me, I retrain them. Um, they say, honestly, it's, it's definitely about building sleep habits for my child and helping them sleep well, but the person who's getting the training is me. So I really like that. I like moms say that I'm retraining them. In some ways, it's about motherhood. It's, it's, I've had a baby for a few months or more. I've been trying to do everything right. And a lot of things aren't going right. And sleep isn't working. And so I feel like a failure or I don't feel confident. I'm just lost and I'm feeling my way through. Um, so I really like to give moms the sense of like, you didn't do it wrong. You're doing great. You just have a really tough kid and you're not a sleep expert and you're not, maybe you're not a childcare expert, even me as a childcare expert. I mean, I worked with behavior kids in school, but when I had my daycare, the kids were easy and sweet. And so I learned more about kids with different behaviors or disorders or challenges uh, when I volunteered at church and I worked in the schools but I've learned the most from my job. And so I would never expect any of you guys to just become a mom and have awesome, strong instincts in the beginning. That can happen, but it's just not very common. I wouldn't expect you to totally know who your kid was and what they're gonna be about, you know, who they are or how to handle anything from the moment they're born. No one, mothers like that, you learn as you go. And the more you can tune into your instincts, the better you're gonna do with knowing how to take care of your child and raise your child. Shutting off your instincts while you build sleep habits does not build your instincts. It doesn't build your confidence. It actually can destroy it, but it also can just make things take longer because you didn't have that experience like you're having. Those moms aren't having that experience like you're having where you are tuning into your intuition now. You're tuning into your child now and building that. So it's, it's a blessing. So um, I think it's funny that um, I want you to call the, the child aspect of this sleep building, but for you, I'm like, we're retraining you. We're retraining your mind and your heart. And that has everything to do with all of the stuff you've been fed for however long you've been a mom or however long you've been reading and learning. Um, it takes a lot of work to retrain yourself. So I just want you to understand, like, I don't want to change who you are. It's just that I want to take away those things that are making you question yourself, making you feel, um, underconfident and those things that make you feel like a failure and those things that are confusing and conflicting. I, I just want to help you with that, especially because my clients who work with me for weeks or months still send me messages months later saying, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure it's going to work? Are you sure they're going to be okay? Are you sure we're going to recover from this? Because regressions still happen. Um, especially every six month ones, but it's always easier and better. They just kind of freak out in the beginning, like, oh no, it's going to be like the old days. And then it's, it's mild and they're like, okay, you were right. Um, sometimes they, they have a tough one, but it can be really scary. And so I'm giving you a little taste of what moms come back to me with. Um, <laughs> so, but like I said, they always tell me that I'm retraining them and how good that feels. So the number one thing is really, truly let go of the rules and what you've read. And I'm not saying things about nature and things that you've proven already. So like if you're a firm believer in white noise and swaddles and, and um, blackout curtains, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all the rules that say 
don't rock your child. Don't feed your child to sleep. Um, if you hold your child in the night and they already knew how to put themselves to sleep, you're messing things up. If you co-sleep, then you're destroying your child's sleep. If your child cries and you give in, you're, you're just going to have problems. You know, I want to help you let go of all the rules that people have created that don't go with your intuition that are mostly about sleep training. Okay. Number two, really, truly tune into your child's needs. When you are worried about a bad habit forming, take deep breaths, blow up that breath and think about what your child needs in that moment. You know what he needs. You're giving it to him. Stop worrying about how things are going to get messed up and you're going backwards and you're going to have problems later. Stop worrying about that. Please just tune into what your child needs and be in that moment. Tune into their heart. Tune into their soul. Tune into your own soul. Listen to your intuition. It will just benefit both of you. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking you to benefit both. Um, and by the way, this I'll share these notes. I'll share my outline in the under the video. Number three, if you are concerned your child is fine and is just being stubborn, because I'm always talking about when they cry for a reason, when they're acting that way, it's because they're going through something tough. And honestly, I do think that that's the case. Most of the time, the kids can be in a regression for months in a row. Moms don't ever believe me. But most of the time that, that is what's going on, or it's that they're just really high needs and really sensitive and really attached to you. But if you feel like they're just being stubborn, make sure you know what's going on. Re go through my regression posts in my Facebook group under the regression topic. Um, in the Instagram, go to the regression highlight and on my Facebook posts. They're the same in the three places. I can help you overcome this sort of thing too. You can set up a one-on-one -on -one session with me. So understand regressions. Know that your child's not having any of these elements. And I mean, separation, anxiety, milestones, growth spurts, mental leaps, teething. Those are all going to affect your child. And if any of them are overlapping, it's worse. And some of them can just be more intense leaps. You know, some teeth hurt more. I feel like some kids go through teething worse when they're older because they're more aware of the pain. In the night, it's always worse because they're not playing. They're not distracted and they're trying to sleep and they're tired and they feel like crap. So what I'm saying is in these cases, if you think your child's stubborn and nothing else is going on and they're still clingy and they're still insisting on being held while they sleep and you can't get out of co-sleeping or whatever it is, I do have lots of workshops, look through those, but you can set up a one-on-one -on -one session with me and we can work through these problems. Okay. So you're not stuck. Um, so back to my list. When you think your child has sleep crutches, remember in my eyes, these are tools, unless you have an easy baby who you can just put in the crib and pat them and say good night, baby. Or if you've tried that for a couple of weeks and it didn't work, most likely your baby's a little bit challenging and you've just developed either survival skills that you needed because you need sleep too, or you've found some tools that actually help your child sleep. Okay. So don't be obsessed, especially the big one is the sleep association. Um, feeding to sleep is not always a bad thing. If it's not broken, you don't have to fix it. Some people are very good about, you know what? I just want to teach my child independence so that we don't have problems later. And I am a huge fan of that mentality, but there are kids out there who feed to sleep and they sleep through the night. It's not a big deal. It's not a problem. It's not a bad thing. Um, if you have to rock your child for five minutes before they go to sleep, that is because your child probably cannot slow down unless you rock your child to sleep. Some people have to cuddle their child or they will not go to sleep. And that's a great substitute for a feeding association. Um, it's just the way it is with these kids. You go from one to the next. You can't always get rid of them all. And then maybe as they get older, you know, you can take away some of these crutches. Um, but just don't stress about it so much. And remember what I said earlier that you can work on naps and bedtime, respond in the night following your heart, and these kids can still sleep well. It's just so natural to feed in the night. It's so natural to need comfort and reassurance when they're changing sleep cycles. We want to help all that stuff go away and it will when they feel well. Um, so work on those remedies and understand all the signs and know uh, what they're going through. And if it's just too hard, then please set up a one-on-one -on -one call with me and I'll help you through this. Um, number five, when you feel like you messed up, remember you were responding, you were following your gut, giving your child what he or she needed, 
you might have been in survival mode and you wouldn't change a thing if you could go back because you did what worked and you also didn't know all that you know now okay so just don't blame yourself number six when you feel like you're going backwards try to think about what you're giving your child i have posted about oh it's in my episode five uh, podcast i talk about all the benefits of building security and being patient um it really truly helps your child's brain helps them develop socially mentally intellectually physically and emotionally to be responsive and teach them security and be engaged and be a very loving gentle parent okay this is an awesome thing um Slow down your expectations and let go of the pressure you're feeling. Your child is feeling that pressure too, and it won't help you. Number seven, no matter what bad habits you think you formed, you can always teach a child or reteach a child. I tell my clients that all the time, like, you know what? No, you're probably not going to have to reteach your child. If you do crib playtime and all the activities and you teach your child trust and you use a non-crying method, um, use a night response plan, all of these things, then your child is going to go back to the strong habits. You're going to know what to do and they're going to just go back to them. It's going to be okay when they feel well, but so what if you have to reteach it? Big deal. You've got the methods, just pull them out of your bag and use them again. I've, I've had it happen because there's been people who've just co-slept and then they didn't know what to do. So I just tell them, use the method again. Um, all right, number eight, it's not bad to respond in the night with holding and feeding. They're natural responses. Your child is craving them. See, I skip ahead sometimes. They need physical touch. They need to eat at night sometimes. Being flexible is the best way to go. Number nine, don't think about other babies and where they're at. Think of your child's needs only. Number 10, don't think about what other people tell you. It doesn't matter what they think. You're the best judge and decision maker. The only one in tune to your child's needs with your own parenting style. Number 11, don't think about what other experts have told you. Trust your gut. And I'm not trying to say only listen to me. I mean, I kind of feel that way because those other experts can really mess you up and confuse you. But what I want is for you to trust your gut because you can listen to me and feel what's right. And you can listen to other people and feel what's right. And you can get rid of the stuff that you don't agree with. And you can get rid of the stuff that's conflicting. And you can get rid of the stuff that you don't want to adopt, you know? There's a lot of that out there. So let go of the expectations. This is the other stuff you've been programmed with is children should be sleeping through the night at this age. They should be sleeping for 12 hours. You shouldn't feed them for 12 hours. Uh, if they wake up earlier than you want, just let them cry for a while. No, actually tune into your child because that's probably not going to help them change. And babies need to eat anywhere from eight to 12 hours after you feed them. 12 hours is a goal, but it's not going to happen for all of them. And it can happen over time. So that's just a couple of examples. Um, let go of the rush. Let go of that I need it now feeling because you don't have a magic wand. So you can't change things overnight and you can't change who your child is. Okay. Um, you're going to need extra patience for some babies go through, you're going to go through really hard times for long periods with some babies. I hate that this happens, but it does. And if you have to go into survival mode or ask for help or make sacrifices for help, please find ways to do it. Find ways to let go. This is a temporary time in your life. You really will come out of this period and you will be able to look back and it's not going to last forever. Number 12, last one. Don't blame yourself for things not going as planned. You're an awesome mom. Okay, it's not your fault. Your child is tough. Your sleep is tough. You've been surrounded by people who've had it easy and that's exhausting. It's not fair and it's not right to you, but you are not the reason things haven't gone right. You've done an awesome job. You're an awesome mom, I promise. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope that it was helpful and I hope that you're doing well um, and I will see you later. Thank you for listening to the Sweet Slumber Podcast, the good, the bad, and the sleep deprived. If you enjoyed the show today, please take a moment to write a review, leave a rating, and subscribe so you won't miss future episodes. This will also help more mothers find my show. Thanks for listening.